Uh, I'm Stephanie Nugent, the Collections Development Manager here at Perfection Learning. Before moving to Perfection Learning, I spent 11 years as a classroom ELA teacher and five years as a school improvement leader. So I'm really excited that you're all here tonight to join our webinar. Before I begin, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. We ask that you direct all comments and questions to the chat, and we'll be monitoring this throughout the discussion. To use the chat function, locate the chat button at the, at the bottom in the toolbar. Use that chat. Uh, using that chat, please let us know where you're from tonight. We also want to let you know that you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this webinar, so please be on the lookout for that. Before we begin our discussion, I am honored to introduce you to our guest. Uh, Ruta Spahedis is an internationally acclaimed number one New York Times bestselling author of historical fiction published in over 60 countries and 40 languages. Ruta is considered a crossover novelist as her books are read by both students and adults worldwide. Winner of the Carnegie Medal, Ruta is renowned for giving voice to the to underrepresented history and those who experienced it. Her books have won or been shortlisted for over 40 book prizes and included on over 30 state reading lists and are currently in development for film and television. Ruta is the daughter of a Lithuanian refugee. Born in Michigan, she was raised by a family of artists, readers, and music lovers. Ruta is passionate about the power of history and story to foster global dialogue and connectivity. She has been invited to present at NATO, European Parliament, the US Capitol, the Library of Congress, and embassies worldwide. She, ha uh, she was awarded with the Rockefeller Foundation's prestigious Bellagio Fellowship for her studies on human resilience. Ruta was bestowed the Cross of King of the Order by the President of Lithuania for her contributions to education and memory preservation, and was recently honored with a post posted stamp containing her image. She's extremely proud to be a Baltic of Baltic heritage, even if that means she has a name no one can pronounce. Ruta lives with her family in the hills of Tennessee. Tonight, we will be discussing Ruta's newest book, You, the Story, A Writer's Guide to Craft Through Memory, and how ELA educators and students can use it to learn how to write more powerful stories. Ruta, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful to uh, to be here and honored. And I have to say that first, I am not uh, a teacher. I, I am a writer, but I am not a teacher. Uh, but to have this opportunity to interact with you, um, I wrote you the story for teachers and for classrooms. So to have this opportunity, I'm really grateful. Well, we are excited too. So I'll jump right in and ask you some questions and we'll have a discussion here. Perfect. Um, remember, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll monitor that throughout. So in an article by Publisher Weekly, you described writing as a wave, saying that most the most meaningful aspects of the story dwell within what you would call the wave of heartbreak, hope, humor, and humiliation. Uh, can you elaborate on this comment and explain how this wave has impacted uh, how you developed this this book, You the Story? Sure. I find that those elements, um, heartbreak, humor, hope, um, humiliation, they are aspects of essential aspects of the human experience that resonate very strongly. Even many years later, I find that when I'm working with students or with writers, they remember those those moments. So we have there's an emotional truth element to them. Um, and they become they can become even behavior drivers sometimes. You know, these memories that we have might drive future behavior or choices that we we make. And sometimes I find that they can be universal rather than personal. Um, I Unfortunately, I think many of us have experienced, uh, you know, heartbreak, but I hope just as many of us have experienced humor and, and hilarity. The other reason, not just because they're so human that uh, and intensely personal that I'm interested in them, 
But they also display juxtaposition, which I think is an essential element of strong writing. Um, if if we've if we feel lost, that's because we've loved, right? Um, mm -hmm. If if we, you know, these juxtaposing elements, which is really, I mean, an old device, Beauty and the Beast. And so I think that um, because everyone has experienced them, tapping into and examining those elements can make your writing feel rich and, and human and resonant. And when I'm writing my historical fiction novels, remember those aren't my stories. I am, am giving voice to someone else's experience with them, for them. And we come back to the same thing, to these waves. That's what they remember. That's what they wanna talk about. And those are the experiences that stick with them. And so that's why I focus on them in the book. Thank you. Um, so as I was reading the book, um, remembering my time in the classroom, um, I think you have a chapter on character and you note that the typical character conflicts, you know, the character versus character, character versus self, character versus nature and technology, English teachers, we've traditionally taught all of these every year, struggled to teach them sometimes. Um, however, I was intrigued by one on your list that was called character versus memory. And I was I was considering how character versus memory would differ from character versus self. And so I just wanted your thoughts on that. I've learned over the years that memory is is a fragile, elusive thing. Some of us are desperate to remember and some of us are desperate to forget. Mm -hmm. And whichever side we may fall on, or even if it's in the middle, that affects the story, that memory. And sometimes there are, are memories or stories that are, are lost that we want. We want a deeper um, experience with those. We want to know more. And then sometimes we, with memory, I find that we're holding back. We're pushing some things down. Um, and again, which we'll talk about later is about framing, how we're framing our lives. And I find that sometimes we try to suppress memories, understandably, it's it's a, a coping mechanism of protection. But so memory isn't as straightforward, I don't think, as, as self, how we would describe ourself, how we would see ourself, our outward personality. Interesting. So if I over go back to the classroom, I'm going to definitely remember that and bring that in. Um, that's a that's an interesting way to think of things, and I I think it's it's definitely non traditional, but so true, especially when you're talking about how people react to the past. Yes, and um, and, also, and that becomes the framework through which we we see ourselves and we see our lives. When I give. Um, an assignment at a writing workshop, whether it's with a school or with adults, you know, and I ask if a book was written about your life, what would the title be? And I find that the title, that framing tells me immediately how the person is wrangling with their memories and how they feel about the story that, that is their life. Thank you. Um, so one of the most difficult skills I remember teaching was the show Don't Tell. Um, I would bring in, you know, Skittles and and bags that you would have to reach in and feel things, you know, all, all things to try to get kids to describe something without just their visual cues. Um, and so it's a really difficult thing. So I was wondering, do you have any tips or tricks that you use to practice developing that skill of showing versus telling, especially when it comes to character development? Oh, um, I don't know if I have any, any tips, but I do go back and I read through my manuscript and it's very obvious to me uh, where the telling is. I look for the word was, and I say, or, or is, is what, and I think, okay, I'm, I'm telling the reader something. How can I show that, that reader something? And for me, through, um, through these descriptors, I remember in my, um, in my book, I must betray you, um, instead of 
just saying, oh, his sister was was pretty. Uh, Christian's sister was pretty. I try to explain it that I say, for example, oh, she she looked like a doll, the kind that's collectible, not the kind you play with. Or coming up with these different um, different ways to describe something um, with a visual instead of saying it was cold. You know, she stepped out of the house and her breath fogged from her mouth like scarves of smoke. How can we show something, whether it's sensory, descriptive, visual, to paint a picture for, uh, you know, for the reader? And we have to be careful because sometimes we can overuse that uh, too. Sometimes I go through my manuscript and I'm like, nope, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> That's interesting. I like the, I like the revision piece. And I know we're going to talk about it in a little bit, um, but looking for those keywords, I think can be really helpful in a classroom. Uh, a good tip, like, it, you know, can you change two of those is's or was's into something versus let's not try all of them. Exactly. And also another word to flag, very. I mm -hmm. use very and so. And if I'm using very, that means I'm using two words. No. You know, how can I find one word? I don't need to say very. Uh, so that's another word that I go through and I flag. Awesome. Um, so one, uh, I lost my place, sorry. Um, writing is a very personal endeavor um, for whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, I think, especially if you're bringing in those human elements. And sometimes it's difficult for students and frankly, adults to engage um, with with that process. In your section called brown chapters, you state that sometimes these brown chapters or difficult chapters in our lives are simply too painful and traumatic to revisit. And I think that's really important as we when we think about how we're asking our students to go about writing because it's such a personal thing. What advice might you offer teachers as they work to create a supportive an inclusive classroom that encourages students to take risks with their writing, but still encourages them to protect their own hearts and heads as they go through um, that process. Thank you for that thoughtful question, which is so important because, you know, writing can be um, a very vulnerable endeavor. And uh, for context about the chapter that you're mentioning about my brown chapter, when I was 13, I painted my entire bedroom a deep shade of fudge. And my family called it the brown chapter because I even painted the insides of my drawers brown, metaphor galore. And again, in showing, not telling, you could say she was a moody teenager or no, she she you know painted her entire bedroom a deep shade of fudge. Um, so how do we uh, work together to create a supportive atmosphere? If you can, teachers, write with them. Mm -hmm. Write with them. I find that when I do a school visit, if I write with the overhead projector and they can see me writing, first of all, um, there is that, you know, mantra, show us yourself so we can learn mm -hmm. about ourselves. And, and, but also that it shows that I, I am human and that writing is rewriting. And they're literally seeing me fumble, express something, delete um, rewrite it, uh, jump, jump, write a couple of different words that aren't even in a sentence, just maybe themes that are coming to me. And to see that process, maybe that will, you know, unlock something for them to say, wait a minute, I thought I had to write in this linear way or no, you don't have to. Uh, and that's also how voice can develop, which we will, will talk about. But I think, you know, writing with the students and allowing them to see that that process can be messy, sloppy, and that's human. Yeah, I remember writing with my classroom a lot. And and it does, as a first year teacher, you know, it was vulnerable for me and I wouldn't do it. But so it was interesting to see how much better my students' writing was when I showed them first that it was a process for me. And I don't get it right the first time either. So I, I do like that you encourage teachers to write with their students um, speaking of writing with students, what other routines, um, do you maybe employ yourself as a writer daily, weekly, whatever, um, that might be helpful for 
teachers of writing to put in place in their class to help students to develop that mindset as a writer as well? I have a couple of techniques and one of them comes out of the world we live in now, which is a curated world of sort of compare and despair where we're seeing all of these examples of perfections, whether it's pictures on social media or, and I have a technique called world on fire that <laughs> I sit down and I, the house is on fire and I have to get something down. I might even set a timer and I'm talking about a kitchen timer where I can hear the tick, 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 tick. And the, the prompt for me is one, two, three, go. And it's stream of consciousness. It, it might not be anything that, um, that makes sense at the time, but what it does is it gets me out of that block thinking, oh, this is going to have to be, you know, this is going to have to be perfect or that sentence doesn't sound right. No, I don't have time for that. I need to go, go, go. And then I had taken um, a workshop with the late, great Walter Dean Myers, and he gave me some of the best advice that I still use to this day, which is give yourself permission to write poorly, to write really badly, you know, have an ugly first draft. And his, his call to action was write crap. And I do that. So the world's on fire and I'm, I'm writing what very well could be junk. But when I end up going back, I have something there inevitably that I can pull out. So between world on fire and, and write crap, the next thing um, that I have is the two words, what if, and I find this is per particularly helpful with students, especially the younger students, um, they really get into this. You know, just those words, what if, I'm looking at the sentence and I say, what if, I'm writing about going to the, the post office, what if a package arrives on my doorstep? What if the return address is from someone I thought was no longer alive? What if I open the box and what if, and just using that, what if creates this, this role, this flow of, of energy and ideas. Um, and again, going back to world on fire, there's no time to question, is this a good idea or is it a bad idea? It's literally brainstorming, what if, what if. And I learned that technique when I worked in the music business. I spent many years working with songwriters and oh. they didn't sit around. You might think songwriters are quite precious about, oh, well, that doesn't have the perfect rhythm or alliteration. No, they were like, what if, what if? And they were spitting things out, looking at rhyming dictionaries. And, um, and that's where I learned that technique. And it's been really helpful for me because I don't, I don't take myself too seriously. Um, you know, and I don't stress about it. And my first drafts are quite ugly and it's really fun to revise. <laughs> Thank you. Those are great tips. Um, so thinking about the book um, and how you outline, I think you do a great job outlining the different parts of a story, you know, whether it's the character or setting the scene. Um, and these are all essential pieces to making a good story. Thinking about these elements, do you find that there are certain elements that younger kids um, should focus on first while older kids can really dig into some of the other elements a little better? I, I do. And thank you for mentioning the structure of the book because I did put it together. So we have different sections on um, the fundamental aspects of storytelling. We have plot, we have character development, setting, the elusive voice, uh, revision, um, perspective. I find that younger students are natural plotters. They can come up and give them the what if prompt. What does the character want? They're also, um, I have found, really willing to work together and share and brainstorm ideas. And that's natural for plotting. With my author friends, we do the same thing. We go to plunch, plot lunch, what if, and we bat around these ideas. And I find younger uh, readers are great plotters. I find that it's so rewarding to work with high schoolers on perspective. First mm -hmm. of all, perspective choosing how you're going to tell the story and why you're choosing, meaning literally a perspective, whether it's first person or third person, but also to examine, as we talked about early, framing. 
how it is that you you see the story that is your life. And in the book, I have certain um, essays, again, in order to show the students, uh, not tell the students, I give examples from my own life. I write these, I've included these essays for them to see how I am executing what I'm explaining to them. And uh, there's an audio edition to the book that um, that I narrate, which was very exciting. And you can get it through your library app, Libby. And with some high schools, uh, teachers have played one of the essays, like um, Let's Run a 5K, or the essay May I Tell You Something, or the essay The Setting is Los Angeles, those three. And the students listen to that. And then they discuss it and they discuss again, listening to this story and relating it to themselves. Have they ever been in a situation where their perspective they learned was a bit askew, their lens was off. They thought the story was one thing only to later realize that wasn't the story at all and how their perception and their perspective changed. And I find that maybe it's just because high schoolers have a few years, you know, a few more years of life experience, um, probably more intimately um, aware of the H's, the heartbreak, the hope, mm. the humiliation and hilarity. They have more experience with that. And so they're able to approach perspective, I think, in a, in a deeper manner than maybe, um, than maybe middle schoolers. But again, I say maybe, I have met middle schoolers who are deep, deep, deep. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that enters into the brown phase, I think, that <laughs> deepness, um, just having a middle schooler at home. Uh, students have also, well, like we just talked about, depending on where they are, how much writing they've done, they have a wide range of writing skills and interests as well, whether they're, you know, a first grader or a 12th grader. Um, how might the t a teacher use this book to help differentiate some of those writing processes for students? I, I considered this when I was uh, putting the book together. And what I do in the book is I suggest trying out different formats, giving students the freedom to tell the story in a format that resonates most deeply with them. For some, the story is the title uh, example, if a book was written about your life, what would the title be? That's the whole story. And to come up with something that's rich enough that there is a story in one sentence or in one title. Um, I also uh, encourage students that they can use bullet points. They they can take themes. If, if they're looking at their own story, the story that is their life, a story about their family or something that's happened to them, are there themes that jump out at them? Write down those themes first. Look at those bullet points. What are those words telling you? Are all those words you know, accurate? Can you change some? We've done, as I know a lot of teachers have, we've done the six word story. Um, I've done a paragraph and I've even done one word. Uh, something else I've done is that students seem to enjoy is write the author's note write your author's note. And they seem to get very into that. And, and the author's note tells me so much about the story. And sometimes through these different format examples, students' voices will really um, become very apparent to me. Um, what it, how, how they express themselves creatively, their creative personality that is voice. Um, and, and I don't know, sometimes some, one student decided recently, um, at a school visit that I did that, that the story was going to be a song. And instead of writing a book, it was going to be a song and a song is a three minute story. That was fine with me. Yeah. So speaking about formats, I think that leads directly into my next question, thinking about how narratives can range from a nonfiction memoir autobiography, all the way to fiction genres like science fiction, fantasy. How can a teacher effectively introduce students to a variety of these genres and styles um, within that realm of storytelling? Oh, that's a great question. And something that relates to what I do, because 
Within historical fiction, if you think about it, historical fiction is quite elastic. I could write a historical thriller. I could write a historical romance. I could write a historical fantasy. Um, a student recently in um, Wyoming said, oh, you don't write historical fiction. You write histopian. And I thought histopian. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so but what I will do sometimes um, when when we're examining genre, I will pull a few different opening paragraphs from different genres and and put them up and we'll examine them together with the students. And is it is it obvious right away what this genre is and why? Um, when we look at the opening page of The Martian, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the student edition of The Martian, it's it, it's not only a compelling piece of work, the, the, the genre is right there. Do we like that? Do we not like that? Do you like something that's a bit slower to, to build up? If you are, if you like adventure stories or or stories of, of you know of courage, does that mean what's the what's the opposite of that? The genre that you're drawn to, then what are the 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 themes that you're interested in expressing? Are you drawn to the miraculous nature of the human spirit, stories of strength through struggle? Then that's maybe why you're drawn. So to look at it both ways, to read it and see, try to identify it, but then also to look at what is the story that you're expressing and what is the best genre for that story? Do you know that when I began writing, I thought, and if those of you who know my work, you'll probably laugh at this, I thought that I was a, a humor writer. I thought, <laughs> right, that I, in my first attempt, I was writing humor. And what I realized, why are we writing in that genre? I realized that what I was doing was I was using humor as a shield. And I was saying, ha, 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 mm. look here, look here. Don't look here. And when my agent, who read two samples of my work and saw some historical fiction. And he said, I don't know what you're trying to hide from. That's your authentic voice. And maybe it's scary, but that's what you need to do. So also examining that, that sort of self-examination, if it's appropriate, if the student is there, if you know that is safe for their head and their heart to say, why am I writing in this genre? Once you, you drill to the why, wow. Once I knew, wait a minute, I'm really an author of historical fiction. I'm not a humor writer. I'm not a humor writer. Everything fell into place, you know, when, when I really embraced what I was supposed to be na and naturally what I was trying to do. And that leads right into my next question about voice. Um, students and adults alike, maybe as you as well, struggle to find that unique voice as they're writing, um, maybe because they're hiding, maybe they, they don't know what their voice is yet. Um, how would you advise educators as they encourage students to embrace their individual writing styles and voice while still adhering to the narrative conventions that they're obviously trying to teach students? Ooh, adhering to narrative conventions. That's the kicker, right? I... I would suggest, and what I do sometimes in writing workshops is just momentarily, we set those conventions aside and we take something that is very established. Let's take, for example, the lyrics to Happy Birthday. That song has been the same, you know, for years and years. Everyone knows the melody. Everyone probably sings it the same way. And I work with students and I say, okay, now let's, let's, write happy birthday. We're going to use the lyrics, but we're going to arrange them on the page in an entirely new way. You can switch around the words. How you use the white space on the page, that also is an element of voice because that's directing the reader into a certain rhythm that the author is then trying to express. And that's what our voice is. It's the distinct personality of our writing. Um, if we find a book on the ground and the cover is is ripped off, if it we'll know it's Dr. Seuss. If we, you know, there's a certain voice, a certain rhythm mm -hmm. um, that's there. And so that's what when we're trying to find and determine voice, what we're looking for. So one of the first exercises can be to take narrative convention out of it. But then another helpful exercise is to use. I find epistolary format to use the letter writing example. And 
have the students, okay, you're going to write one very brief letter to your grandmother or to an elderly person. You're going to write one brief letter to the principal of your school. And you're gonna write one brief letter to your buddy. How are those voices different? Which one feels the most natural to you? Which one feels, and it's not necessarily, believe it or not, the, the letter to the buddy. You would think, yeah, that, but not really, it, not always. It really depends. And which one do you feel most comfortable writing in? Which one felt the most, the most fluid? And then examine, um, examine why. And voice also is something that the more you write, the easier it becomes to identify voice and voice is different. There are people who have a genre voice like Stephen King, he's the voice of the supernatural and the horror or Mary Oliver is like the voice of nature. Mm -hmm. But then there are people like Roald Dahl who have a very distinct rhythmic um, type of, of style that creates his voice that you would know. So there's different kinds of you know, different kinds of voice. And I think just identifying voice and, and becoming familiar with it helps guide us on our own journey into voice because voice is something that um, it's, it's voice also, it's layered in, in our memories, right? It's layered in the framework, how we see something. Are we a voice of positivity? Um, how, we, how we freight words, what do I mean by that? The word failure, um, for some people, that's a suck hole of soul death failure. <laughs> but, but someone else might say, failure is a forest of exploration. The voice that expresses that word failure is going to be very different um, dependent on the framing and the lens that you're looking through. So I love to examine that with, with students, you know, um, how are they framing those memories and how does that create the voice of their work? Interesting. Thank you. Um, so I think every teacher at some point has felt put in a box. So sometimes we're required to teach narrative writing and we have to assign a specific topic like overcoming obstacles. When we have these kinds of excuse me, parameters um, with students that are that we have to adhere to, how do you think that either helps or hinders students' creativity? That's a great question. Uh, and, and both, as we know, some, some students won't be able to write without the prompt. Some people need sure. those prompts. Um, but I find that at times the prompts can be too narrow. Uh, if we use overcoming obstacles, what if we just say obstacles? Some students might feel they haven't overcome something and that word overcoming or overcome that they can't relate to obstacles they can so if, if we can um make the prompts a bit more general then i feel that they can sometimes be more approachable for um you know for the students to dig into and write about interesting i like that someday when i go back to the classroom <laughs> Um, so technology, we are a world um, accustomed to technology, and it continues to play a significant role, especially after the pandemic in students' lives. Um, how do you personally leverage digital tools or platforms to help you with the narrative writing experience? This is or maybe uh, you avoid them. <laughs> well, but and this is a really timely question because with all of the conversations about, you know, about AI and um it's interesting for me because people say, oh my goodness, you know, AI will, will dramatically change your process. But what I find is that the topics that I'm writing about are often quite obscure. Mm -hmm. Many of the texts and books, they are not digitized. They're not offered online. I have to go to the ends of the earth to find these texts or or get them through an inter, rare interlibrary loan. Um, and I don't load them myself. I read them and I, I take my own notes, but I don't you know, digitize them myself. The other thing is that my work is built from witness testimony and, mm -hmm. and survivor testimony. Uh, and often that also is not online. 
I absolutely use old school tools, thesaurus. I use the, the, the power thesaurus. Um, I do use when I'm doing events, um, I find with some students, they don't feel comfortable voicing out loud, let's say a theme or a feeling or a, and if I'm in a, a, a classroom where I know the students are serious, you know, where they're not going to bomb me with these things, I can use Mentimeter. Uh, and Mentimeter allows the students to interact either over um, an iPad, a laptop, or their phone, where I will co collect, for example, um, you know, tell me, um, tell me something you would, you know, a topic that that you would you would really not want to write about, and everyone will tell me that, and then up on the screen this will populate in almost like a word cloud. And we can see and we can discuss and say, okay, wait, why, why does no one want to write about fill in the blank? Or, or what are we seeing here? What are we seeing these themes? Or in the books that you love, what are, so those kind, I use technology sometimes for that, for that kind of like group, group source. I don't know, I just find that that anonymity gives students sometimes a freedom um, to, to take part where they normally would never take part. They wouldn't raise their hand and say something, sure. but they, they do. And so um, I, I use that. Um, and other than that, I mean, I really, I'm still, I, I could use Scrivener. Scrivener, you know, is a program for writing that would make a lot of sense for me because I'm collecting so much research and so much information and so many photos. I don't, I use Word. I, you know, I use Word and I write dialogue longhand. So, I mean, how old school am I that I'm writing dialogue? Um, and the other thing, talk about not taking use of, making use of technology. When I'm drafting, I write with my eyes closed. Um, I'm so grateful that my, my, you know, beloved mother encouraged me to take a typing class one summer so I can actually type. But I close my eyes because I find that that allows me to be inside the story instead of uh, from the outside looking in. Um, so I know that those aren't very advanced technologies, but um, hopefully thoughtful ones. No, that's that's very yeah. interesting. Um, I never thought about the eyes closed, but it makes sense. I mean, because then you're not focused on, oh, I made a mistake. Now I have to go back and fix it right now. That's exactly it. And and I, I'm no longer an observer. You know, I'm an active person participant in this in this story and uh and I'm not judging you know the sentence structure and then I go back and I think oh my gosh I have to make sure my hands are on the right keys because if they're not then I could lose <laughs> some some good stuff but but yeah but then I go back and and it feels there's a a nicer flow state to it I haven't always done this but there's a nicer flow state as well if you're not judging the words as you're seeing them I think so that brings us to a great point about revision. And um, it is a dreaded part usually for students. I think even for me personally, I think that's a dreaded piece. Like I, it's hard to go back sometimes. Um, how would you suggest students, re, you know, approach the revision process with students um, while maintaining the enthusiasm for storytelling? Because I think they get bogged down to like, oh, I'm going to, you know, start diagramming sentences here to make right. sure my grammar is correct. The way that, because you're right, revision, they just start to, to roll their eyes. And I, I often say, hang on a second. Uh, how many of you are athletes? How many of you are musicians? Are any of you dancers? Are you competitors? Are you coders? Are you programmers? Imagine if you could go back to your game, your competition, your performance, and you could change something. Oh, how many of us wish? Can I have a do-over? That's what revision is. That's the way we have to look at it. It's this incredible opportunity. Imagine if we could take the test again. Oh my gosh. We can, as writers, we can. That's not a drag. That's not an obligation. That's a gift. And it's a super fun opportunity. And I explain, like I said earlier, I'm not a writer. I'm a rewriter. I'm a marginal writer, but I'm a strong rewriter. And, and my editor will tell you, I am holding on to that story until she has to rip it from me and say, you're done, you're done. Because 
I don't know. I don't look at it as revising. I just tweaking, perfecting, polishing. You know, if you can polish and polish and polish, and that's the way I ask them to uh, to look at it. Excellent. I still think it's going to be dreaded. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the, uh, the other thing is when I do show them the difference between my first page of my draft and the final of the first page. It is there is such a marked difference between. I mean, we're talking the difference of this is in the trash can, and I don't have an agent, and I don't have a book deal. To you know, it's not like oh, this is this is going to sell well, and this is going to be a bestseller. No, I mean it's so dramatic. Uh, and I say, well, wow. Well, if if this is your first, this is what your first draft is like. Imagine what it could be. Excellent. Um, empathy and understanding diverse mm -hmm. perspectives, I think is something that your work, obviously you've been awarded for doing those things. And it's something that I think schools are really focusing on these days too, is making sure students understand and are empathetic to those not only around them, but throughout the world. How can a teacher guide students in exploring these themes in writing? I think that probably starts um, in teaching students um, to write stories. I think we need a conversation to think about why we tell stories at all, right? Because we become so focused with either the, you know, the, the perfection of the execution. No, why are we telling stories at all? And that goes back, as you said, to empathy to facilitate human understanding. And when I meet with students, I often give them examples because I'm so passionate and I'm so fired up about, about what I'm doing. And to some extent, even when they're looking at me like, wow, you're really over the top about this. But then <laughs> if I give them um, an example, um, and many of you, if you've heard me speak, you've heard me give this particular example that for many years, you know, my father, who was a refugee, um, he was hesitant to share or tell his story. And in his neighborhood, he was really quite misunderstood. And there was this narrative around that my father was unpatriotic because he didn't go to the neighborhood fireworks. When my father finally shared his story with a neighbor boy and explained that he wasn't unpatriotic, that when he was a child, he lived in a camp during the war and there was a military base near the camp and it was often bombed. And sometimes when they were bombed, the bombs missed the military base and hit my dad's camp. And he saw and heard terrible things. And, and on the 4th of July, it's so difficult for him because he hears those concussions. He knows I am, I am an older man. There's not a war going on. I am safe, but he can't reconcile this. So he, he stays away. And do you know that when the neighbors learned my father's story, the kids told the parents, the parents told other parents, the atmosphere around <clears throat> my father went from criticism to deep compassion because they knew his story. If we don't know someone's story, we might constantly be misjudging them. And this is the power of why we, we tell our, our stories. The tendency is if we don't know someone's story, the tendency is we try to fill in the blanks ourselves. That's totally natural. We make assumptions, but sometimes we create false narratives. I don't know all of my neighbors. I don't, I've tried to get to it, but I don't know all of my neighbors. What am I missing? How could our community function better? Um, might we find out that we're more alike than different? So with this, with empathy, I think, you know, first and foremost, if there is an exercise that's safe in the classroom where we can find out, and even if instead of individualizing it, if that puts people on the spot too much, what can you find out about your school? What are some stories about your school? 
And how does that maybe even perhaps help you relate better to the community you're in, the building you're in, you know, the story and the history of your school, you know, that facilitates understanding, um, mm -hmm. knowing, oh, wow, I, I never thought about that. I didn't know that's why that banner is there. Or I didn't know that there was a fire at the school. And now that's why we have these systems in place. Um, knowledge of story helps, you know, it just, it, it does, it helps those the emotions, instead of standing between us, flow through us. Interesting. Thank you. Um, we actually have a couple questions um, coming in from our audience. So to put you on the spot, <laughs> the first one says, I am using a book currently with my freshman class as we work through create a creative writing unit writing short stories. We are using memory as a source of story ideas at the moment. I was wondering if you have advice for students on what kind of memories make the best short story ideas. Oh, well, short stories to me are, are an art unto themselves because I, I maintain it's easier to write a 300 page novel than it probably is to write um, a short story. However, for short stories, I find um, that uh, memories that have, um, again, we're going to go back to the H's, humor, mm -hmm. humor, uh, have some element of that humor or, again, heartbreak in a short story, that's really hard. I, I go more towards humor, something that is a bit lighthearted where there might be a reveal, you know, something, you know, delightful, those kind of positive memories, I feel, uh, make good short, make good short stories. Um, another one that we have coming in. Oh, you, you'll like this one. What advice would you give teachers who are teaching on the Holocaust? I'm having students create diaries for fictional characters. And I want to do a project on justice. Wow, what <laughs> a powerful unit. And, and first of all, thank you so much for, for doing that and thinking so creatively and deeply about it. What you are doing will, will make the history human for your students. And that's what I would um, encourage is um, it's my mantra with historical fiction. How can you make that history human? Because at that moment of connection, a statistic becomes a human being and we feel much more connected to the history, the story, and especially to something like the Holocaust. Can we feel a sense of justice if we might not feel connected to that character, the human being, and what they're trying to uh, what they're trying to overcome. So I believe that that will start with with characters and and meeting um, somehow, like I say, making these the history human. And there are so many wonderful resources out there. Uh, the Holocaust Museum has incredible portals and tutorials, um, you know, for doing that uh, and. Wow, I, I I would love to be in your class. <laughs> um, so thinking about diaries, I know you talk about the difference between diaries and journals in the book, which I have to say I hate journaling, and I my students hated journaling, and I think it was because it wasn't authentic. And I I liked how you talk about the diary is the authentic voice that's you spilling your soul where no one else can see it. Um. So I, I also agree that it's a dying art. So how would this teacher go about talking about the difference between diaries and journals and, and how they were and are still used a lot to capture one's story and history? Well, let's think about this. And of course, the type of diaries that I'm talking about, they had miniature keys and locks and a journal doesn't, I mean, a diary that just by nature was like, this is secret. This is, and if we even go back to the example of the, um, you know, the teacher who's working on, you know, the Holocaust unit, what would be in a diary of, of someone 
who was hiding, who was running for their lives, who was trying to survive? What would be the content in a diary versus uh, a journal? I think it would be dramatically, uh, dramatically different. And um, the voice of, of the diary is a different voice than uh, there is to a diary. There is a sincerity, sometimes a desperation, um, a longing. Um, in a journal, there are observations and thoughts. And, um, and I do wonder though, if students today, I'd be curious to see what the teachers say in the chat, if students today are even familiar with the concept of a diary, what does that word mean to students, I wonder? I'd be curious what the what teachers say, um, because a diary just itself might, I mean, do, you know, do, I know that they have some digital diaries. Some students tell me that they have like a, a digital, you know, digital diary, but yeah. It's interesting just looking at the chats. Um, so, so one um, teacher, or participant commented that she sees them, she can see the difference, but she kind of considers them the same thing. Um, and someone else said that they think that um, a journal seems more authentic to them, having Ooh, written a diary um, many years ago. And so, so that's definitely um, something, but definitely lots of diary and journals are lost art. Um, they I, use saw, Instagram. I saw in, Instagram. Okay, yeah. but on Instagram, would you really confess, you know, the person that you had a crush on on Instagram? Like to me, that was like the function of of a diary. It was this this ear, this shoulder, dear diary. You know, um, you know, and, and I'm not. I don't know. Would they use Instagram or Snapchat for 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 or be real or I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just roll my eyes at my 17 year old. Um, <laughs> uh, we do have another question that's come in um, that says she's going to have her students read. I must betray you next semester. And they're going to follow that with personal essays. She asked, what should I have my students think about while reading the book that connects to the ideas, um, the idea of them telling their own personal story in a meaningful way? Thank you for this question and for using I Must Betray You. As the students are reading it, I would love for them to think, what is the price of freedom? What is the price of freedom relative to the story that they're reading, relative to the history behind that story? And what is the price of freedom in their own life? How do they relate to that word freedom? What does that mean for them today? What does it mean to the characters that they're reading about? How can they compare and 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 contrast that? Um, also, I would uh, suggest that they dig into some of uh, the sources that I list in the the back of the book. One is a very short documentary called Chuck Norris versus Communism. And it's a story about how, movies from the United States that made their way secretly into Romania, how that window into a democratic world affected the Romanians to such an extent that it also helped inspire them to fight for their own freedom. What was it about these movies? How can they deconstruct art, culture, music, books? And what impact do those do those elements have um, within totalitarianism or under this, this form of communism that, that Romania suffered under? You know, things like that, questions that relate to freedom. And also, I know I'm going on and on, Radio Free Europe. This window to the, the Western world that was illegal, that Romanians were fashioning these these uh, illegal antennas to get a broadcast. What kind of impact, uh, in, when you're in an oppressive or closed society, does that information that comes over the radio wire, you know, through this hot rod rotted wire, what influence do they think that that had? Interesting. 
Yeah, uh, I love history and it's amazing, but it's sometimes hard to, I think it's sometimes hard to relate, um, especially when you've never been in a situation like that. But I think some of the best stories come from that as well, because some kids relate in ways you wouldn't have expected. Oh, completely. I did a school visit today um, and and uh, the whole, entire school had read, I Must Betray You. And it's always so interesting to see which elements the students, you know, choose. And this, um, this one classroom, their takeaway, they said that in the book, I explained that there are, there are items that just aren't available, right? And drinking a Coke or having a banana, this is something that, that was not available to Romanians. But what the students pointed out that they said, this was shocking. I said, what? They said, tampons, tampons, mm. like the smallest thing that we might take for granted. It wasn't that, that the Romanians didn't have hot water. They were malnourished. They had ration cards, but they didn't have tampons. You know, these kind <laughs> of, of, of observations um, and how something so small uh, could, could result in such large courage for a human being who has nothing. Um, yeah, they found that inspiring. So, well, thank you so much, Ruto. We've enjoyed our time with you. Um, I, we're going to start closing up, but I want you, if you haven't already claimed your free copy of Ruto's book, You the Story, we're going to drop a link into the chat and you can request that now. It's a gift from both Perfection Learning and Penguin Random House. Um, and we are so grateful that you were with us tonight. With the remaining time, Ruta, um, would you like to tell us about any upcoming projects that you're working on? Give us a sneak peek. Yes, I'm always working on multiple projects. It takes me five to seven years to research and write each book. Um, and in terms of research, I always tell the students, swap out the word research for investigation. I'm mm -hmm. a historical detective and that's what I feel like. And so I am investigating um, several parts of, of history. I'm, I've been investigating a story of former Czechoslovakia. Um, I just finished a book that's set during the Battle of Britain, which I co-wrote with a dear friend of mine, Steve Schenken, who is an amazing author of historical nonfiction. So bring historical nonfiction and historical fiction together. We've uh, we've collaborated on this book. It's set at, Ble at Bletchley Park following the story of a brother-sister codebreaker team. And that um, also reaches down, I would say, to middle grade students. Um, and I, I have all sorts of different projects that I'm I'm working on. And doing events with schools is not only such a, a wonderful opportunity for me, but often it funds my research. Um, you know, these are things that I, I have to find ways. Uh, for example, in in uh, February, I'm going to Southeast Asia. I for a project I'm working on, I have to go to the Philippines and research. And um, and I love doing this, and I love bringing the stories back to the students and the teachers and sharing my investigations with them. So uh, I'm just so grateful that schools, you help me do, teachers, librarians, you help me do what I think is important work, but what I know is my heart's work. And what a joy it is to be able to do your uh, your heart's work. Uh, very much so. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion, um, offering your time and your insight to writing and creating better writers in our uh, classrooms. Just a reminder for our participants, we will um, be sending out an email with a webinar recording tomorrow. Um, again, if you haven't claimed your free copy, make sure you click on that link in the chat to do so. Um, we, we, do, we do ask that it's one per, uh, per person. Um, and then stay up to date on all of our great ELA resources that Perfection Learning has available. Other webinars like this, you can subscribe to our Next Step blog by visiting uh, the, the chat link as well and never miss another uh, webinar that we might have or any of the great resources that we link as well. Um, it's been great to have you here tonight and um, I think you for the privilege of getting to chat with you, Ruta, and enjoy the rest of your guys' nights. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone uh, 
enjoys the book, you, the story, you can find me in all the usual places on social media if you have any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much again for your time. Um, everyone enjoy your night. Thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye.